With us this after, or excuse me, this morning, we have, I think, three excellent panelists, and we're going to each of them are going to give just a brief uh, overview of, of what they do and where they are in the in the whole scheme of things. And then we want, do want to open it up for some some interaction, any questions or comments that the audience has as well. Uh, we have with us to begin uh, Mr. Jim Tucker, who is the former president and CEO for many years of the International Association of Fairs and Expositions. He is now their general counsel. We have Mr. Leon Vick, who is a senior director of rodeo and horse show operations for the National Western Stock Show and Rodeo here in Denver every January. And we have Ms. Abby Powell, who is a senior events manager for the Ranch Events Complex in Loveland, Colorado. And any of you ever, if, if, you, if you have been there, you know that's a wonderful complex that's been built in the last several years and being built even, even further now. She also serves as the president of the Colorado Horse Development Authority. So first I'm going to ask uh, Mr. Jim Tucker to come forward and introduce himself and, and give you a few comments. Jim. Thank you, Scott. I'm going to just shoot the breeze here for a little bit because there's a thing or two that the next two people on this panel have to say that's important and I see there's a lot of folks out there getting their coffee so they can stay awake through it. Uh, I spoke to this group in 2013 and um, it's nice to be back, you know, as an outsider I don't have DVM after my name on my name tag. Uh, being an outsider you always wonder if you'll ever get asked back and, and that's ex kind of uh, extremely important to me because if you read the program you'll see I'm a fifth generation farmer in the Ozarks and if any of you have been in the Ozark Mountains you would say to me, uh, you would wonder uh, why would you listen to anybody whose family would try to farm in the Ozarks for five generations. Um, it's hilly, it's rough, uh, we're, we're at the end or maybe in the middle of Tornado Alley if it wasn't for the Iowa and Illinois farmers coming down to Branson to watch the country music shows and scraping off their boots, we wouldn't have any topsoil at all in the Ozarks. Um, I guess my family, they came across Ohio, Indiana, Illinois, to the, and across the Missouri River, it's pretty good ground over there, to the Ozarks to farm. I guess maybe they think the same thing I do, and that is you really don't know whether you can farm or not until you try it in the Ozarks. I have a slide, oh it's already up, and I'm going to be pushing this button to see if I can get it in the right place. Um, what is the IAFE? The IAFE is the International Association of Fairs and Expositions. We're member-based. We were formed in 1885, been around a long time, part of three centuries. Our headquarters are in Springfield, Missouri. They were in Chicago for many years. Our mission is to lead in representing and facilitating the evolving interests of agricultural fairs, exhibitions, and show associations. And they have been impacted by the ADT, and we're going to talk about that. Uh, one of the things I think is important to understand about fairs in this country and our membership as well, we've got 1,102 fair members. There are probably about 3,000 agricultural fairs in the United States of America. We also have membership in South Korea, Australia, United Kingdom, New Zealand, Korea, and Mexico. I've been there. I've worked with those people. I've seen Canada and Australia address ADT and animal identification. Another thing that I think is important for you to understand is that 80% of our members uh, have an attendance of less than 100,000. The, the National Western is going to, uh, this represented here, the ranch, big attendance. But we have a lot of fairs in this country that are small. What do we do for them as the IFE? We have a magazine, a website, we have an e-newsletter, we push news alerts. Uh, we have networking at convention in Las Vegas that's going to be moving to San Antonio next year that draws about 5,000 people. I've been lobbying for the interests of agricultural fairs in Washington, D.C. now for going on 37 years. Fifteen of that I spent as the CEO of the organization. Uh, and we educate. You know what fairs are. These are pictures from fairs. I like to say to people that fairs are nonprofit volunteer-based, government or quasi-government, community celebrations centered around agriculture. Think about that. 
Think about the fact that 150 million people in this country go to fairs annually. Where else in our society does our population go to interface with farm animals? No place. We're the last. We're the bleeding edge. We're the leading edge, whatever you want to call it. That's what fairs are. Fairs are the Olympics, if you will, for 4-H and FFA kids. We in fairs, you in fairs, because many of you have a role in them, are on the battle line, the front of the battle line of the, of the, the battle for the hearts and minds of young Americans against PETA, HSUS, animal rights folks, people that do not want to have any use of animals in agriculture for food purposes. We're, we're in the front line of that. We're the best opportunity to reach that population because there's no place else in this society where people go to kind of figure out or hear or learn what's going on in agriculture. I know they want to ride rides and they want to eat food and you see those pictures, but there's, we are uh, in a very unique place. Here's a, a breakout of the members, the members and the attendance of those fairs. You see, 81% of our fairs are under 100,000 in attendance. And I don't have the numbers of uh, how many animals, livestock, that would be covered by the ADT were at fairs last year. I can give you this as a breakdown from our fairs that answered about the type of animals that are covered by ADT that are at fairs. Surprisingly, swine is the, the largest number. The fastest growing group of animals or types of animals, species of animals coming to fairs now are, are goats. I want to put on my hat for a minute as a cow-calf operator. Um, if you read the program, you'll know that I run a, a cow-calf operation and diversified one with some row crops in southwest Missouri. I get animal traceability. I get the global market. I've been around the world in this international association, uh, and I, I went by a slide that shows where we are. You've got the United States, you've got Canada, you've got the United Kingdom, you've got Asia, Australia, New Zealand. I've been there. I've seen what it's like. I've seen, as I said, what they do to, to uh, identify animals and carry those records forward. I also like to say, and it was in the last slide, kind of stole my thunder, 95% of the people, the population, 95% of the 7.2 billion people we share this globe with currently do not live in the United States. Our agriculture, our future uh, will only be successful if we are successful in addressing animal identification and traceability. And I listen to my friends from Oklahoma and Arkansas neighbors yesterday talk about it's more than education. And I'll tell you a short story. Early in my law practice I was driving down the, in the Missouri Ozarks to try to find a witness and I was going down a little gravel road and I went by a little pasture with a little fescue in it and some sprouts, more sprouts than fescue and a few head of cattle. I pulled up to the house and there was a fellow too, a man and a, and a young boy up on the roof of the house with a big wet blanket over the chimney. And I thought, oh my God, they've got a flu fire. It was in the fall, it was cool, and they just started their first fire. And I, I whipped in the driveway thinking I should be a good guy and try to help. And I said, what, what's going on? Can I help you? And he said, no, you can't help. The old lady won't let us change the TV channel and we're smoking her out. <laughs> now I'm here to tell you, that guy is not going to voluntarily put an RF, RFID tag in a calf's ear out there in his field. I don't care whether it's low frequency or high frequency. He ain't going to do it. So we got to have some teeth in what we're doing. Now, let me, let me move on to my lawyer hat for a minute and direct some of these comments at, and they're not here, the drafters of this regulation that went into effect in 2013. You know, I, I think as I began to talk about that, about the slide that Dr. Rohr put up in here yesterday, showing the United States and where the animals come from that come to the National Western. Leon's going to talk about that. It's like, holy crap. Talk about an opportunity to vector disease. Fairs, shows, exhibitions, 
are the Petri dish. I mean, we've got it going for us in that regard. Now, you got to think when you look at the ADT rules, think about the fact that fairs are not a place where animals are commingled to set price and to accommodate transfer of ownership. That's not our deal. We don't do that. We, maybe a little bit, but, but very little. The ADT rules, in my opinion, as an attorney, were written for the marketplace. When, when lawyers look at regulations and statutes, they kind of approach it from, when my client gets in trouble, what am I going to do? Uh, I'm going to slip on past that slide. And so, when you look at that, you look at what are the enforcement mechanisms of a law, a regulation, and who's the gatekeeper? Okay? What's the enforcement mechanism and who's the gatekeeper? So you look at this and it's pretty simple. The idea of animal identification. Will ID the animal? We'll tell you how to do it. We'll do an ICVI and put the identification information on it. We'll send it to the state vet of the state of origin of the livestock. He'll send it to the state vet of the destination of the livestock. And there'll be a record keeper that the cattle or sheep or goats or whatever is covered got there. And they're required to keep it for two to five years depending on what kind of animals they are. Okay, look at the regulation. The regulation says that the gatekeeper is the same person in many situations, if not all, as the enforcement mechanism. And the enforcement mechanism is you've got the recording and then you've got the, the statement that nobody will move or receive livestock that don't comply with 9 CFR Section 86. If you look at who the recorder is supposed to be, it's an approved livestock facility. That's who's got the obligation to record that and keep the records for two to five years. Fairs, by the definition and the regulation, are not approved livestock facilities. And it's important. And I think they're not for a reason. Number one, approved livestock facilities, when you read the regulation, are really places that have a sale every week. And secondly, they require that a veterinarian be present. And I heard you guys talking, the fellow from Alabama yesterday, about it's hard to keep him there all day. But there's, there, there's required to be an accredited veterinarian or a state health official at those facilities. Why? Because when the ICVI is presented and the decision is made about whether it's been complied with, it's done by a professional. Many times at the fairs around this country, when the ICVI comes, and I should stop and say for a moment, small percentage of the cattle that, and, and livestock covered by ADT that go to fairs are interstate, most intrastate. What does that mean? That means if this is going to be addressed effectively, it's going to have to be addressed at a state level. Okay, but let's go back for, to where I was and, and talk about this, the accredited veterinarian being at the approved livestock facility, but most of the time not being at the fair. We can't find them. I see Tony Forsty from Ohio sitting out here, and I know he's got an obligation. He's required by his regulations. He's he's push that, that every fair has to have a veterinarian present. But think about this. Some little kid with a gleam in his eye with this heifer he's been doing everything with and sleeping with for the last six months pops up at the fair with his CVI. It's not complete like it's supposed to be. Some volunteer at the fair who runs the grocery store uh, during the day or works at Walmart, has a kid, came out to help at the fair, gets it handed to him, and he's got to tell the kid, no, you got to take it home. He's the enforcer. He's the gatekeeper. It won't work. We need veterinarians at fairs. 
at every fair in order to do the job. I want to say this and then I'm going to sit down. We don't want to be the problem. We don't want to be part of the problem. We want to be part of the solution. Fairs are agriculture people, the salt of the earth, doing the best they can to feed and clothe and fuel the rest of the world. We need your help. That's the implication, I think, that it has on fairs, exhibitions, and rodeos. And I'm going to turn it over uh, to Abby, I believe, is next, to talk about what we are doing. And it's remarkable, making a lot of progress. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Jim. And I think you brought up some very good points that I think now Leon and, and Abby will probably further with some, some more on-the-ground experience. Our next uh, presenter, our next panelist is Leon Vick. Leon is a uh, Colorado native, been in rodeo, I think, all your life, and now, of course, runs uh, one of the, the biggest and best uh, rodeos and horse shows in, in the country through the National Western Stock Show. So I think is, 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 when his presentation comes up, we'll hear from Leon a little bit more about the stock show and just the magnitude of that. Leon, welcome. Thank you very much for uh, the, the introduction, and thank you guys for allowing me to be here and, and present some of the things that we do and attempt to do and strive to do better on a daily basis at the National Western Stock Show. Uh, just a couple of, of brief items that, that I'll be talking, talking on today, and I... I apologize in advance. I do have a set of cheat sheet notes here with, uh, with additional remarks as a reminder for me because on each and every one of these topics, I can eat up 45 minutes of all of your time, and it will be very boring for each of you except for me. So uh, <laughs> I'll apologize in advance for that. Uh, the, t the time to vent cattle bucking stock, the rodeo horses, tracking of, of each of those animals, the, the contract act animals, and this sounds really simple, especially in, in this crowd here, the health papers, but uh, that is a very key tool for each uh, fair and, and, and rodeo. Time to vent cattle. 90% of our time to vent cattle are Mexican co co Mexican Corini steers with a M brand, and it makes most people, especially in this room, cringe when you speak of of of, of those steers. At the National Western, we we try to uh, we we. We do use one herd provider for those steers. It helps on the TB testing. It's easier for us to follow and trace when and where those steers have been tested. We know that uh, the, the, the provider we use keeps, keeps very good records when those steers cro cross the border. Uh, when, they've, when they come to Colorado, they, they sit for 60 days and get their final TB test. We we use uh, approximately 85 steers for the Sirison event and uh, 110 in the team roping, and then our our, our roping calves are a native calf. Usually, we it's a it's a mixed herd. We are a a, a January event, those calves are probably going to be southern, southern calves, so we really try to concentrate on a, on a good set of health papers from, from those calves as well. And the, the gentleman we use usually puts those calves together about 75 days prior to the National Western, which is nice that that, is a, that, 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 that group of calves is, is in the, the, the same herd as, as, as long as they are. Our, our bucking stock. This is a, uh, a a challenge for us each year. On the papers, we use multiple contractors. We use up to 15 providers for 350 head of, of bucking horses. Uh, the, these horses come from the United States and and from Canada. So it's really nice to have that quality set of papers on 
on, the, on those horses. This seems really easy to do, uh, but this causes me a lot of, of, of heartburn. These horses not only come from, from 15 different providers, but these horses within the last 60 days were, were standing next to an additional set of horses that came from God only knows where, another 25 states pro pro probably. So uh, we, we, we do try to keep a very, a very close tab on, on those. The bulls, we use about 150 head of, of bulls, uh, including the, the PRCA rodeo and our PBR event. Bulls are very touchy. We, we, we try to house them. We, we use the, the, the same pens for those, but we try to prevent any nose-to-nose no, any -nose contact or shared water with the Mexican steers. We have had issues in the past, and we're trying to, to avoid that in the future. Rodeo horses. This is a interesting group and uh, as bad as it sounds we simpled everything down and got a better compliance from these as we ever have. Each, each rodeo horse that, that comes to the National Western Grounds has to have a current set of, of health and Coggins papers and sign a, a declaration sheet. We'll get into the, I'll show you the declaration sheet in, the, in, in, in a minute. Uh, the, these horses are not there for a very for a very long amount of time. They're there for a day, maybe a night or two, two at the most, and then they change over to a, another set of of, of horses. There's uh, approximately 450 to 500 head of those horses that rotate in, in and out of our grounds in a 16-day period. Tracking of these horses. This is our our declaration form. It's pretty easy. It's pretty simple, and it's a great tool for us. Each each, each horse that 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 goes into a stall has to has to be on on a declaration form. It does not go on owner. It goes on trailer. So you can have multiple owners if they trailered together. The main information we're looking for on this is contact if something should happen, and where did that horse come from before he got to Denver? This, this, we, we have had an issue in the past. Carl can testify <laughs> to, uh, to this, and we've, we've tried to learn from the situation that happened in, in Ogden several years ago. Where did that horse end up coming from? Where is he going to? That's, that's the information we're after on, on this. When I said we, we simplified it, asking for health papers for rodeo contestants, you, you will get them, but it's like pulling teeth. I mean, you're asking for their firstborn. You're asking for information they shouldn't have to give to you. You ask them to end up filling this out, and they're tickled to do it. That It's almost like a, a badge of honor because I just came from Fort, from, from Fort Worth for the second time this week. So that, uh, that, that simple tool is a, is a very good tool for us. Along with this information, we end up tracking the stalls that the horses are in. I can tell you what, what horse was at Denver on what day and what stall he was in. We don't need that information on a regular basis, and I hope we never do need it. If there's an outbreak of something, we would like to know what horse was stalled next to, across from, behind the horse that is a issue horse. This, as well as 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 a flowing chart for our stalls, is is is. Those are the tools that we have that we hope we never use. The, the prevention, it's a simple deal, especially in, in this crowd here. We always give our, our contestants and horse exhibitors, all of our livestock exhibitors, a, a, a simple gift. This last year we was thinking on the prevention side, this was a gift that, that we gave them, a digital thermometer. It happens fast, easy. 
90% of your rodeo contestants probably never take your, their, their temperature of the horse. And even, even more than that, would not know what the normal temperature of a, of a horse is. We put our logo on there so that, of course, we get credit for it, as well as a normal range t temperature of, of, of a horse. We ask each of our, each person that, uh, that, that receives that to temp their horses on a daily basis while at the National Western. If we get them to temp them once, we're, that's a win, uh, because as a, as a rule, most contestants do not. So I think this, this tool will help us in the prevention and spread of, of, of anything. Contract Act horses. This is, the, this is the culprit that almost got the National Western in a bind a few years ago. For fairs and rodeos, this is the animal that probably is the, is the forgotten animal. We hire these people. We hire them. We don't require them to do the same regs and specs as, as your contestants or, or, or your exhibitors. You don't get a good set of health papers on them. You don't, you, you don't do, do a, uh, a, a traceability on them to find out where that horse ended up coming from. That's Mo Buddy. He's been here for 15 years. He ends up knowing what's going on. That's, that's your culprit. A rodeo horse is, is at your facility for a day, maybe two. He's running, he's running up against another 50 to 75 head of horses is all he's going to be in contact with. These animals are at, are at your event from about two to three days before it starts until the last day it's over. Every animal on the complex comes in contact with this animal, and that's the one that we don't even think about. So uh, we, we had a, a wake-up call, and we pay a little closer attention to, the, to, to these animals as, as we're moving forward. The health paper, it's, it's a great tool. Uh, as, as, I, as I just learned, uh, Dr. Rohr showed the uh, the traceability of, of 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 the National Western on a slide y y just yesterday. It's amazing where those health papers end up coming from. This is a wonderful tool. Most events do not use it. When I say that, most rodeo events do not use it. Rodeo might be a culprit that in, within its own own category. Uh, this is a this is something that that we rely he heavily on. As you can see, this is some steers. It tells you the age, uh, uh, and and a negative TB test on it. Along with this, we we uh, we 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 receive an an individual for each steers. With, with this comes a paper with 72 numbers of steers, so that we can we can track them if something should happen. Why does we do it? You know, fairs and, fairs and rodeos are entertainment, and uh, they're great entertainment. We, we had 685,000 guests cross, end, up, end up coming across our grounds in 16 days' time. Without all of the precautions we're trying to take, if we get shut down, one, we are bankrupt, to 685,000 people that do not get to touch ag are cheated out of that opportunity. Thank you. Thank you, Leon, and, and uh, I think a lot of people in this crowd probably have been to the National Western. It's an amazing event and really well done, and it's interesting, too, because I know in leading up to this panel, we had a visit, the panelists and I, and, I and, and Leon right now has a facility that it's aged. It's, it's been there quite a while, and, and that makes it a little more difficult in what you're doing, but you're in the process of getting a new facility, so that's kind of exciting. So our next speaker uh, is Abby Powell, and Abby and I, and I spoke of the events the Ranch Event Center up uh, by Loveland, north of Denver here, a relatively new complex that continues to grow, and I think she has a different perspective that she might bring to, to the conversation as well. Abby, welcome. Well, thank you. Boy, when Katie called me and asked me to speak, I thought, 
um, with this group. <laughs> um, I am definitely out of my box here. I am the horse girl that came to speak to you all on our facility and what we do with events. Um, the only letters after my last name in my title are M-O-M, which I am very proud of. But um, yeah, I'm gonna hopefully scare you a little more. Boy, boy, we don't sound like we have a, a great control on things, but we are a group that would like to head in the right direction, that's for sure. So hopefully we can give you a good perspective of what we do. I'm really going to focus on the facility and the facility management side of things. Um, I, I started with a, a picture of the racing pigs because Leon's exactly right. Boy, um, has anybody had pig races at your event or been to a fair that has racing pigs? Um, when I brought this group on, they only had racing pigs. They had dachshunds along with it, which boy was that even more fun. So. Um, we are the, the group of fun up here. We, we do racing pigs, we have rodeo performances. Um, the real scare that scares me when I bring it to the fair every year is the bucket calf show. Um, who's familiar with having bucket calf shows? Um, all of these wonderful kids bring in these little calves who are all most likely, and most of them brought from a production facility. They bring them, they expose them to everything at the fair, and boy, they, a couple hours later, they take them right back and put them right back in with everyone else, right? That is exactly what happens. And let me tell you, when Jim was talking about that volunteer or that vet checking in, those bucket calves at the fair try turning away that five-year-old because that CVI isn't right, or that calf has a little bit of a snotty nose, and I don't think we should allow you to, sh to show today. That's what we're up against. That's what we're up against. So um, we have all of these fun events. Um, and all of it seems wonderful and good until, I'm not sure I can click on my link, but I'll tell you what the link is. It is the latest news of the fair that was shut down just last weekend, um, September 23rd, for a case of swine flu. Um, so we go directly from being all fun and games to the reality that most of us want to avoid, which is having something like the swine flu, um, having kids in the hospital with swine flu symptoms and flu-like symptoms, and the kind of PR that that brings to not only the agricultural industry, but particularly to our facility. Um, but we control that, right? We're going to do all of the vet inspections coming in, or we have a vet on grounds um, checking in every single 4-H animal, looking at them, seeing what they do. Um, we're taking precautions of separation, just like Leon said. We think we all have all great in our minds. We're separating everything. We're sanitizing in between. Um, that MOM title gave me a whole new perspective. <laughs> Because the reality, when you have all of these groups of animals together, those two right there, the one on the right belongs to me, and that's his best friend in the whole world, they touch everything at my entire grounds. Come out to the fair, they want to touch the racing pigs, they want to touch everything in the carnival, they want to touch every animal that's out there. So all of your precautions and everything you just did went right out the window with those two little guys right there. And <laughs> there was hundreds of them, right? They're all doing the exact same thing. So it's a real challenge to keep that disease control um, in a facility, in a fair like we have. So what does that mean for the facility? Why should the facility care? Um, what's the facility's role in all of this is kind of where I'm going. And Leon mentioned it earlier. Um, there's one in particular instance that all of us in the facility management world say, and we all say Ogden, Utah. That is what really set the whole world straight was Ogden, Utah. However, does anyone name the event that happened in Ogden, Utah? Nope. No one refers to that event as a cutting horse Western Nationals. Everyone refers to it as Ogden, Utah. And what did that do to that facility in Ogden, Utah when they had an outbreak of EHV-1? It really, really had a huge impact on their business, as you can imagine. So that's what's in it for us. It's that lost business. It's our future outlook, and it's the security of that. Um, it, it comes down to that liability and where we can go with that in the future. Um, ensuring that we're 
safe for our next event to come in. You know, we're constantly churning through things, especially at our facility. You know, I had one summer in 2012, we literally went from being the fire evacuation shelter at one point, I had over 400 animals in our care for the High Park Fire in Northern Colorado. Um, talk about a scary situation. We were giving a lot of those animals the best care, veterinary and farrier and, and otherwise, that they'd seen in a long time. Um, I literally cleared them out of our facility and went through all sorts of sanitation protocols because the very next thing we were having was the National Dairy Goat Association show brought in all of those dairy goats who did have a lot of protocols in place, but cleared them right back out um, and brought in our county fair. So all of that happened in the month of July um, in 2012. So we have to be really cautious about what we're doing and how much we're bringing through our facilities. So thinking through everything you were talking about yesterday, we're gonna talk about the facilities and logistics a little bit. Um, so if we're going to high frequency ID and when and where is that going to be read when you come onto a facility like mine or Leon's or any other fairgrounds? Many fairgrounds, we are newer like we've said, um, we're, we've only been open 14 years only open 14 years, I sure as heck don't have the facilities to be reading IDs as we bring in. How are we gonna handle that? Where are we going to either be able to scan and get those trucks in and have that control point? Or how are we going to do that? Right now, you know, we have a lot of maybe jackpot and livestock shows. It's everybody's family pulls right up to the barn. You unload, you go to your stall, you bring your CVI to the office. Isn't that a little too late? <laughs> I would say it is, but we don't have those, those control points and those places in line to, to take care of that as they're coming in and the, the logistics that that creates. So whose job is it to enforce those requirements? I really thought about that a lot listening to all of this yesterday too. Is it the event organizer? Is it the facility? Is the state agency responsible for those? I think those are some things that we're all gonna have to work together to decide who and how that's enforced when it comes to these events. Um, there's a lot of other things to think about when you look at those logistics. Um, a lot of my hat in this was thinking about not only the fair that we run in the end of July and August or other events that I do like the circuit finals rodeo coming up where I'm with Leon, I know exactly where all those horses were stalled and where they were and where they're gonna be next. Um, the scary part is all of the events that I have in between where I don't know where, boy talk about bringing in a team roping over Labor Day weekend, USTRC finals. Those guys are coming in, bringing their horse for one night, leaving the next one. The event organizers don't even know who was in which stall. So that's something where we've got to plan ahead. How do you know if you were going to quarantine a group that you have concern over, especially in those times? Um, do you have those quarantine facilities and where could you put them? Um, that's something that we've worked with Dr. Heckendorf and I know you've done a lot in the state to help bring those up to speed. But it's these logistical things that the facilities have not worked through yet and many I you know I jump on conference calls with these discussions of emergency plans for facilities across the country and it's shocking how many are pretty far behind they haven't thought through these things yet and they definitely haven't thought about having ID so that's where it goes is that most of our business year-round has to do with that third-party client or rental contract um, so I think a lot of this is the um, consideration of us facilities, something that we can step up and start doing to help enforce what you're doing, is um, in our facility contracts and asking our um, different groups that come in that it's really up to them that they need to be fulfilling either the um, health certificate requirements or any identification that's coming up. Um, that's really up to them. I have to enforce that to, for them to enforce. Does that make sense? Um, we also need to make sure and do a, a good job ensuring that every contractor that comes in is aware of our facility's emergency plans. Um, that includes um, handing them our protocols of what happens um, if there's a disease or outbreak and how we're gonna control that. Um, we also have to really work towards collecting accurate records of who was on property and where in your facility they were stalled, like I was talking about in the previous slide. Um, 
some events are easy. You know, you have a quarter horse show come in, they know exactly where everyone was stalled. This trainer had this group of stalls, this one was in this bank of stalls. Very different with a team roping. Um, we also have all of these horses that were registered to maybe be in the event um, and are showing in the event. For every five at a, a good show that you say is showing in the event, I bet there's two or three that they brought just to bring them to town. Get them some experience, ride them in the pen, do all those things. They're not registered in the show, so we don't have tracking that those animals that were there. Um, and then the other thought that really came yesterday was the frequency of events. I think people would be shocked by um, the Dr. Rohr's slide with how many animals came from other states to the National Western. Um, just thinking through probably the last three months of events at my facility, the number of events where not only were the horses and the participants um, coming from very much so across state lines, but um, the cutting that I had just a week ago all the cattle came from Nebraska um, and were coming off a cow-calf operation in Nebraska, probably came through, across through Wyoming down into Colorado and they were headed to a feedlot after us. Um, many of them are yearling cattle, so not sure how ID'd they were. So um, that's something that all of us to think about, just to scare you a little more for the end of the day here. Um, the next thing we're thinking about is that effect on the future facilities. Um, we gotta start planning that way as we're planning our facilities. How are we gonna control these things? How are we gonna do a better job? Um, I'm sure as Leon's planning new facilities, boy, I always have the same things in mind. Um, something we're up against is what materials are we using? Are we building in quarantine areas? Are we making sure that we have less dirt floors and wood panel stalls and having a heck of a lot more areas that are easier to sanitize? Um, and then, do we have the technology resources? Um, you know, if we were to go out and be scanning all of these um, animals that come in through the parking lots, do you have Wi-Fi? Do you have con connectivity? Do you have power? Do you have all those things that you need um, at that ancillary area before they get into your facility? Um, and then where do you match that up, um, the cost of getting those facilities up to par as we continue to improve? Um, one other thing I wanted to address are those accuracy and staffing challenges um, as we go into all of these events. Um, my first thought is, do we have enough vets out there to be writing all of the health papers day in and day out? I'll tell you, when we were at the point of requiring health papers for every um, animal that came to our grounds, whether it was the VS or the EHV1 outbreaks that were out there, I heard from vets over and over, all I'm doing, my full-time job seems to be running up and down the road writing health papers. That's all I do these days. And I, I can't keep up. Um, we were really going back to a lot of our events and suggesting, you know, a lot of people are burdened by trying to get health papers just to come to an event, especially if it's a, a more local or regional event. They think, oh, I'm going to pay my vet to come out just to write one health paper for two horses that I'm bringing. Um, it's not really worth my time. Um, for us, it was working really well to try and get the reverse. I suggested only have a four-hour window. Normally, anybody can come within this two-day period. Nope, you got to be here within these four hours and have a vet there to check everyone as they come onto the grounds. Really have helped with that. But having those staffing challenges. And then who's qualified to look at those health papers? Um, and are they accurately reading them? Do they know what they're looking for? And do you need to have a qualified vet reading those? Um, unless you're using an electronic ID, here's the real point is you look at those health papers and boy is it true when I run a national draft horse show in January, you look at those health papers and they say that they've got six black Percheron horses, no markings, solid black, their names are Jim, Joe, <laughs> they all have about three or four letters and start with J and um, they all come off of the trailer. Do, do I know that those six horses that are on that health certificate are the ones standing in front of me? Probably not. Probably have no idea because I know they have about a hundred at home. So how, how do you know that? And that is something that we're working towards all of you that have been at the, the equine forums of, of microchipping and going down that same road. But it's, it's a challenge that we have. 
So where do we go from here? Um, livestock industries are all obviously pressing for better identification, better traceability. Um, can us facilities do our part and step up and start re making these requirements? Um, obviously the famous question there is who goes first, you or me, Leon? <laughs> Because in that, we take that risk. If I step up and I say, I'm gonna require everyone to have that positive ID when you come onto my facility, and that causes a burden back to those events and back to those organizers, boy, they're gonna be like, well, Leon's not requiring it. So I'm, I'm gonna head right down the road. So it's gotta be sort of a one or all. Um, We've all got to be on board and we've all got to stick our toe in the water. Um, and the other thing I would encourage is this group to really continue to reach out and have communication to the facilities and to the organizers um, with updates on what the requirements are and what technologies out there through things like the IEFE and the League of, League of Ag and Equine Centers. Um, we're all out there talking to each other so to so join the conversation. Thanks. Well, thanks to all three of our presenters. I think they gave a really good uh, background. We do have about uh, seven minutes for questions. Um, and uh, Katie and Ben, I think, will have microphones if there's questions from the audience. I do want to start with one question to, and, and, uh, to Abby and Leon first, but then I want Jim's overall perspective. And that is, you mentioned electronic ID would make your lives a lot easier. How much is that being used within your facilities right now? Um, electronic ID yep. within our facility? None. Okay. Leon? Same answer. <laughs> Same answer. <laughs> yeah, and, and that's interesting too because the flow of those animals, you'd make, especially with the bulls and whatnot, that uh, I would imagine would make your life a lot easier if that was part of the protocol. On our livestock show side, we. On our livestock show side, we, we have. Uh, started to use electronic uh, on the on, on the rodeo side the electronic version that 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 we use is we started a email so that contestant that the rodeo contestants all carry their their health papers on their phones so they can that they can send us a a copy of those instead of just showing them to to us that's the electronic version okay yeah yeah there you go <laughs> jim your thoughts uh, we're in the beginning phase. We got a long ways to go. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, my name is Jeff Baxter, and my daughters uh, show some calves in Texas, and so we use EIDs on all of the calves that are validated and all that kind of stuff. But I think probably uh, a vulnerability assessment that I would say needs to take place, uh, particularly in those shows, is there's a very rigid process. And when you check in animals and, and they're coming in and they're doing the IDs and matching everything up, when people leave, it's a free-for-all. And so you have no idea what steer or what heifer potentially gets in what other, you know, what, another trailer, and then that animal heads off to another destination. And so when you're talking about, you know, trying, if something were to, an incident were to happen at this particular, you know, expo, and then try to track down those animals. I think what's uh, interesting is there is a very rigid process. You know, they want to know that the animals that show up are the ones that are supposed to show up. But then on the backside, I'm just telling you, it's a circus uh, when you leave, and there's nobody checking animals which way they're going or any of that kind of stuff. So I think uh, some type of vulnerability assessment uh, of each, um, you know, expo would be interesting because I think that would uh, expose where the weak points are in the system. Thank you, Jeff. Question here and back over here. Um, Abby and Tim, uh, and Leon, excuse me, that was excellent. Thank you very much. Uh, in Georgia, the way we do it, is uh, we try to have at every exhibition, livestock exhibition, one of our livestock inspectors. But at our national fair, 
and our big fairs that we have. Uh, at our national fair, we generally have anywhere from seven to 15 livestock inspectors present checking animals in, every animal that gets off a trailer, and at least two veterinarians uh, on site from the department. And then also there are veterinarians on call from the surrounding area. So, uh, but the, the problems that y'all both identified, those are the problems. And uh, I would ask of you uh, that people such as yourself that have large events and are in the know and are, are, are knowledgeable about these, these gaps, we'll call them, this is a popular word, uh, share them with the little guys. You know, uh, these, these big events typically uh, do know the, the risk involved, but the small county events or whatever that are going on almost every weekend, um, typically that's where you can have a lot of problems. So uh, uh, I appreciate what you do, and uh, I agree that, that um, this is a melting pot, or somebody called it a petri dish, I believe it was, <laughs> uh, um, for, for disease. And so uh, thank you very much for your efforts. Okay, I think Dr. Hickam in the back has a, has a question. I have, a, I have a question, I guess more of a comment. Um, I, I guess I would challenge you as to the electronic identification that you're seeing coming through your event here in Denver. Um, when you look at what we do at the American Royal, when you look at our state fair, I, I don't know what percentage, especially of the swine that come through there, but a lot of those already have electronic identification in them, and that's what they're moving on. I just don't think we, um, at those, those events, and we've started capturing it, the group with the American Royal captures it on all the swine. Um, but I think we need to look at that as a means of how do we capture that ID and put that into some sort of system. Um, I think there's many more equine that have microchips, and we're just not reading those microchips. Um, even with our goats and sheep that come into the state fair, there's several that have microchips or have some sort of electronic identification in them. Same with our cattle anymore. Um, but, but we're not capturing that. I mean, we capture it on an on a official health certificate, and it goes into our database. So, you know, and I, I think that's something else that maybe we haven't done on the state side a good, a good job of educating. But we've, we've all made tremendous gains in what we do and how we handle data in our databases anymore. Um, we do have a lot of information on movement that we can easily obtain and search. But I, I, I think we probably need to look at those um, exhibitions and we need to see where we can pick up that data because it's there. We're just not getting it. I, I guarantee if you if you walk through your swine building at the National Western, you look in those pens, those pigs have RFIDs in them. Thank you. I will, uh, I will apologize for, for the uh, lack of clarency on that. The, the, the National Western, the, we are a rodeo, a livestock show, and a horse show. I was, uh, I was giving general information on the, on the rodeo today. Our, our uh, livestock show does use the, the, the IDs, and they, and they capture a lot of that. I was just uh, staying with the rodeo side today. If you want to talk about the rest of it, I'm, I'm here until 5 o'clock, and it'll take all of it. <laughs> okay, thank you. I would, I would just like to add to what you say. If you think about fairs, you know, for part of three centuries, what have we been doing? We've been connecting an animal with an individual and deciding whether that animal is a good or bad animal, whether its genes ought to be in the gene pool going forward, and we're giving prize money. I mean, we've got the data. Ironically, it's, we need help getting it into a database that's searchable rapidly because of the numbers that we have. And we need veterinarians, congratulations, Georgia, uh, to help get that job done. Great point. Dr. Rohr, I think, has a question. Actually, just a comment. In, in Colorado, we've worked with a number of different venues, and uh, Leon and Abby have been an active part of that. Really what we've tried to focus on are business continuity plans so that what we're really trying to coordinate is, is thought and response effort that works specifically for a number of different venues that if a problem happens, how do we have the least impact? 
And, and the, the quarantine word is used periodically. We feasibly don't even think, there's no way you could really do that. You know, the, the ability to isolate livestock that are animals of interest in an event is the right thing. And then I think state animal health officials realized pretty quickly after Ogden, you really need to be able to permit those animals back to the state of origin. And we've done some of that. And you know, we, you have to. You, you can't hold them where they're at. So I think there's been a lot of good things that have happened. And uh, Leon National Western's been, I think, on the cutting edge of doing some right things. And looking back, there were some things that we decided together to do with the livestock superintendents. And I thought might have been problematic. And they actually went you know, in the past very well, uh, National Western requires a BVD test for all bovids and some of the other llamas and, and camelids. When that first happened, I thought, how many people would show up without it? In reality, only a handful each year, and we do just-in-time testing, but they don't unload until they show proof of that test. The other thing that was done for the, the cattle sales, seed stock sales, was a requirement of official ID didn't have to be an RFID, but official ID and um, supposed to be listed on the CVIs. And we worked with the, the show veterinarians, the Mike and Lori Scott. And I was surprised when that went in. There was good, and that's probably the key. You all do good messaging and you have good communication tools with your participants. But uh, when you know, a lot of seed stock, they didn't want to put a tag in their ear and understand that. But um, the ones that did showed up without it, that Scott's worked with, like they said, no, yeah, no problem. And I, I thought we might have some pushback. I'm sure there was some that we didn't know about, but it was the right thing. And, and I think whatever the venue is, we've worked a lot with CSU Extension for smaller venues across the state. Uh, when we had PED and swine, we had biosecurity uh, toolkit for swine events, and we've done the same thing for equine. It's their event, it's their plan, we're there to help, and we want to get their veterinarian to be involved. They don't have to be there the whole time, but when it makes sense. But I, I think there's some real success stories, and uh, a lot of the record keeping for individual ID of animals, whatever they use is fine because, and it's never complete, I understand, it's never 100%, but most of them for, it, it starts at the county, and then those events lead to the state fair, but the, the individual 4-H, FFA, uh, CSU extension people in the counties, they got it. Uh, they already do this stuff, and you know, it, it's been a good effort just to become involved with, to come alongside, to help them do what they already do good at. Good. Dr. Rohr, thank you very much. Again, this is a discussion, as Leon said, he could be here till 5 o'clock. I don't know the rest of us can, but again, help me thank our panelists this, uh, this morning. I think they did a fantastic job. Thank you very much. Terry.